Hi everyone, I am Simone Corpru and I am the executive manager over at the Wimberley Playhouse. Um, while we are dark at the theater, we are doing a series of interviews with different designers, creators, to show you how we take a show from the script to the stage. So today I have Nicholas Bordovsky. Um, he is a wig designer and a makeup artist, and he also serves on the board of directors at the Playhouse. So hi Nicholas, how are you? I'm doing good, how are you doing Simone? Doing good, thanks. So Nick, how did you get into doing hair and makeup? Well, um, I've always been interested in it and I, you can go back to my friends that I was really close with in high school. I was always messing around in makeup and just playing around. Um, but I kind of married two things that I was really interested in, which was uh, drawing or painting and then live performance as far as theater goes. And uh, it really, really started with makeup. Makeup was always my driving thing. Um, I went to cosmetology school and got licensed as an esthetician. So I learned the ins and outs of skincare and a lot of muscle and body function, like way more than I would have anticipated. But as a result, um, I kind of got this, this look into the dermatological side of everything, the actual science of skin and things of that nature, and that that continued to boost me along my path doing makeup. Right. Awesome. Yeah. Um, and like you said, you know, the all the, the muscles and everything like that, um, in theater, I would say that's very important because oh, absolutely. we are so expressive, um, and that's yeah. something you want to convey to the audience. Absolutely. So, um, what what does a wig designer do? Like, what is the process for designing a show? So I don't necessarily think it runs any specific format. Mm -hmm. I feel like it's different every time. It's a very organic um, uh, situation. But you work in tandem with the costume designer, the director, the choreographer and the actual performers. You have a lot of places that are pulling you because you have to look at functionality of it as far as telling a story and the cohesive look that you're creating for the stage because I feel like with the, uh, the costume designers and the other people that are behind the scenes creating the overall aesthetic, their job is to tell the story visually while the performers perform it, you know? And so it's this really delicate balance you must follow. Um, so typically the way that I start with designing a show is I will get with the costumer and I will look at their costume plot and we can kind of hash out different ideas and concepts, a lot of uh, photo boards, things of that nature, and kind of figure out like, okay, so so-and-so is going to be wearing this outfit in this scene. This is the hair that would complete that look. Right. Um, but then it also goes so far as to, you know, with a musical, really having to know what the choreography is, to yeah. know the functionality and the ability to actually use that hair piece. Because if we have somebody in long straight hair and they're, they're jumping and, and flipping and stuff, you know, like, it's not going to look the best on stage. It's going right. to get wild. So... It's, it's this fun little balance, but, you know, you, you end up uh, creating everything and then destroying all of it and starting from scratch and right. really, really fine-tuning little details to figure out exactly what is going to work for the, the piece that you're working on. Right, and I feel like, you know, you were talking about functionality, like getting a hairpiece to stay on during the course of a show, I feel like right. that would also be a challenge. Absolutely, that, that comes into a teaching moment because in a lot of shows, especially in smaller venues, wigs aren't necessarily going to be the most realistic. And, and you, you can find some very cost-effective options through different online avenues that mm -hmm. you'll just have to uh, mess with a little bit to get them to work in a, in a close setting. But, um, there, there's a whole teaching moment that has to happen. And most, I feel like most uh, actresses and actors know the roundabout by the time they get to a performance level, even in a community theater, um, of how you pin your hair, how to do pin curls, how to apply your wig cap, all of that, you know? And so that, that's really where it starts. And then beyond that, there's also opportunities to, uh, 
because we're not going to put everyone in a wig, you right. know? <laughs> so there, there's that other thing where you're like, okay, these three are wearing wigs because they have to. The rest of the cast, I don't need that. That's a cost that we don't need to uh, right. take from budget. So how can I create a cohesive look? How can I teach these people to style their hair in a sense that matches up and aligns with whatever hair pieces are on? Because typically those aren't going to change. You know, it, it is a set style that takes a lot of time to implement. Mm -hmm. And so you, you have to create this overall, okay, is that a wig? Is that not a wig? You know, like that, that's, that's what you're going for. Yeah. That's the goal. Right. <laughs> okay. So what, what does it take to like care for a wig and to make it look realistic? Uh, so I'll start with, uh, with the realistic aspect. So one thing that I see in a lot of, uh, larger, larger theater settings, professional settings, um, they map the hairline and then they will actually tweeze out hairs of the lace front to match that person's hairline and thin it so it's not so full right at the beginning because it's not realistic then. You have to have that gradient fade. Um, and I mean, you, you can even do that with cheap lace fronts. It, it's a little bit more daunting and there's a little bit more room for error because they're a lower quality, but it's still a very doable, doable mm -hmm. thing. Um, and then as far as, uh, well, I should say, there are other elements. Uh, when wigs are too shiny, you can rinse them in a uh, fabric softener and that will dull them down a little bit, which gives them a little bit more realistic appearance. Right. Um, something that I've learned from a person that I've worked with in the past, uh, I mix baby powder and water in a spray bottle and you can yeah. spritz the hair and it'll mattify it just a little bit. Mm -hmm. So there, there are a lot of a lot of different tricks of the trade. So it right. just depends on what issue you're trying to assess. But as far as the bare minimum of it goes, especially with like lace fronts, there's an opportunity to create something realistic for the performer that's actually wearing it. Right. So now, as far as care goes and upkeep, it just depends on the show. I mean, I've, I've done, I've designed for shows where I dropped everything off at the beginning of a four or six week run and not heard from them until the show was done. Um, and then there have been musicals where it's been like, all right, we had a really rough Friday and Saturday. Can you fix this before our Sunday show? And it's like, yeah, of course, you know. Um, so sometimes it, it has to go into actually resetting the wig, starting from scratch, washing it out, completely restyling it. Um, that's a more extreme case. Of course, I don't want to do that because that's tedious. Yeah. But, uh, but the other thing, as far as performers go, the way that they care for them backstage is mm -hmm. quintessential. If you take it off incorrectly, if you allow others to play with it, right. things like that, you know, uh, when it comes to wigs, I think of them under the same guidelines as props. Yeah, it's I not yours, don't touch it. <laughs> don't touch it. If it's not yours, don't touch it. Um, don't let anyone play with it. <laughs> right. Please, please yeah. don't. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, it, there are different things that you can do. Overall, uh, you can't go wrong with an aerosol uh, hairspray. <laughs> Just right. lock it into place, you know? <laughs> yeah. And I will say, you know, for people watching in the theater world, we say, if it's not your prop, don't touch it. Just because so much work goes into making it that yeah. if somebody who doesn't know what they're doing with it messes it up or breaks it right. or anything like that, well, all that work's gone down the drain and it's the same thing for a wig. Absolutely, absolutely. There, there was a show I was in recently that it was my own fault. I didn't put my wig, or my wig, I didn't put my prop back where it belonged and so the next performance, instead of being a good performer and checking my prop, uh, I went on stage without it and had to improvise. And it was super fun, but that's why we love live theater, so. <laughs> so what would you say is um, like the hardest part of uh, doing wigs and doing makeup for a show? Makeup, I, I don't really see any issue with it, of course it depends on the show because you're you're talking everything from moon over buffalo which would require a period makeup but very simple mm -hmm. to cats which is all fantasy and face paint so right. i mean like it runs the gamut and it really it depends show to show mm -hmm. um 
in my experience, there have been specific shows where costume changes included makeup and hair changes, uh -huh. uh, which I mean, that's very common, not necessarily makeup, but hair changes is fairly common. But when you have a quick change that also involves changing someone's makeup, that is a choreographed dance that you have to learn. Right. And so I feel like that is probably one of the most challenging things. Uh, with, with wigs and changing those, once you get into a fluid motion of it, it, it becomes clockwork. And it kind of the same thing with makeup. Makeup, I feel like, is always a little bit more, ah! because you're not just putting something on you're not applying a hat right. you know like okay i gotta blend this really really you have 37 yeah. seconds and you're changing costume too you know like yeah. so I, I feel like those have been my most challenging moments backstage but it it really it's show to show totally different animal you know right and i know like in um in some shows like for example bus little whorehouse in texas where it is kind of more like minimal makeup Mm -hmm. um, you kind of talked to the girls beforehand and said, hey, like, here's some techniques or here's some ideas that go right. with the time period. Um, so is that something that you do a lot with actors where you kind of like walk them through? Here's a basic idea, but you are you are kind of on your own. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, it, it depends on the show. Um, mm -hmm. I, I've only worked on a couple of shows where I've actually applied makeup each right. performance. And those those were like more fantasy or a couple that included um, drag characters and like it needed to be done by a professional. But um, yes, as far as a lot of period shows, things like that, I'll typically teach like an hour long class with a lot of different pictures that I pull up from Google and, and, and just analyzing what's going to be cohesive, what's going to look good on your skin tone and what's also going to be period appropriate because there are so many, Makeup has gotten so popular in the last like mm -hmm. 10 years. Um, everyone's a makeup artist. Yeah. And, you know, from YouTube to Instagram to Facebook to any other social media platform, you see tutorials constantly. And there's a very specific look that has gained a lot of popularity. And, and it's, it's that Kim Kardashian kind of look. Right. And where every, everything is very severe, everything is very um, exaggerated. It's, it's beautiful overall, but it's very now. And it's become so popular, such a popular trend, like the thin eyebrows in the 90s, that it's something you have to combat with people's normal makeup. Because I'm like, that's cool that you can go out clubbing like that. But like, like you said, Best Little Whorehouse, right now you're a hooker in LaGrange, Texas in, yeah. in the 1960s, you know, like, we got to change this up a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> That's not exactly what you would have looked like. Right, right. <laughs> so what is, and I know you've worked on a lot of shows, so what is the craziest show as far as wigs and makeup that you've ever worked on? Hedwig and the Angry Inch, 100%. How the feeling? <laughs> 100% love that show to pieces. I will work on that any opportunity that I have. I, I love, love, love that show. But since the Broadway debut of the show, things uh, were very much glammed up, which is great. It, it got this um, fresh coat of paint on the show. And it's not that they changed or augmented the story. They, they you know, jazzed up the music a little bit, but... Um, they gave it this really Broadway look. It had these really, really concise costumes and it had wig changes, which wasn't really a thing before because if anyone knows that show, it's a 90 minute one person show where that person doesn't leave stage. Yeah. So that's a lot in its own. Like mm -hmm. that, that in and of itself is like daunting. And I feel yeah. for any performer that's performed as Hedwig. <laughs> um, like it's it's a lot. But uh with Broadway, they had these wig quick changes. Mm -hmm. And so fortunately, I uh I have a lot of friends that are in the industry um in professional settings across the US and on Broadway, and I got in touch with somebody who knew Mike Potter who was the original designer for the 1998 off-Broadway performance, the film, and then the Broadway. Um, and so I got a diagram of how they did everything and learned how to take a small base wig and sew magnets into it and then have half-cut wigs that had magnets built into them so you could just stack, hold the bangs, rip the wig off, throw the next one on, and it always aligned because wow. of the magnets. 
it was it was it was a whole thing but that is not anywhere near the craziest part of that show oh so <laughs> there is a character that is in the show uh, as a secondary character and it's Yitzhak, which is Hedwig's husband. So it's traditionally played by a woman, mm -hmm. and she is in like a grunge rocker male drag. Mm -hmm. In 40 seconds of the closing number, you take her from not, ma not just, uh, or I'm sorry, rather, you take her from her male drag to not just female, mm -hmm. but to drag queen. So it goes from one other, side of the spectrum to the other. And let me tell you, the, this one performance, or this one production that I worked on in Dallas of that show, we had six people in that costume change. Because it's a full costume change on top of that, of course. Yeah. Um, so we took off all of her undergarment material that was locking things in. We put her in a corset. We took off her male wig, we took off her facial hair, we completely cleaned and washed her face, Right. applied lipstick, false eyelashes, full eyeshadow, foundation, blush, contour, highlight, mm -hmm. um, got her, her microphone, her handheld mic, put the wig on, pulled her skirt up, laced her into her high heel boots, whole thing in 40 seconds. I can't even imagine doing that like in it one day. It was nuts. It was nuts. Like, it was to the point that with her consent, we uh, we put up a GoPro because she was like, I mean, I'd kind of like to watch it. Right. And the, it was our last night of the production and the GoPro had tilted, so it didn't catch any of us in view. <laughs> I can't but imagine. I mean, 40 seconds. It was a choreographed dance and, and we changed her in the lobby because that's how she exited the, the theater. So it was just like, get over here. So Ooh, go, go, you know, go, go, like, go. right. Yeah. And I, you know, if you've never been backstage um, during like a quick change or something, there is literally an actor standing there. And, you know, if you have six people on that, there's six people like surrounding that actor, pulling and putting new things on. And it's crazy. It is theatrical magic. It is insane, and it is such a rush. <laughs> right, and yeah, when you do it right, it's like yes, it looks. So yeah, good. exactly. I mean, there were there were so many nights that like we would hand her her microphone, she would stand in front of the doors waiting for them to open, and have like two or three seconds to like just breathe and re-enter yeah. the show, and like those were the nights that were big victories because it right. was always like. Oh God, oh God, oh God, is she, is she going to make it? You yeah. know, even after we had been doing it for a long period of time, every night that was still the mentality, which is probably for the best because oh, if yeah. we were relaxed, she wouldn't have, but yeah. wouldn't have yeah. happened so that's the craziest. And every time I work on that show, that's one of the first things I think of. And of course the person playing the lead is always like, okay, but what about my hair? And I'm like, we got to sort this out. Wait Yours was easy. Like... <laughs> Just stay there for a minute. We'll get yeah, to you. Yeah, like hers happens to music. There, There is a verse and a chorus that she has to change, and that is it. <laughs> Wild. Oh, my yeah. God. And, and another thing, um, you know, the Players is a small venue. Right. But you've worked in some really large venues. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I have. So what are the different considerations for makeup at the Playhouse versus somewhere huge? Well, you know, the larger the audience, there there is a term and... I don't think it's a theatrical th term. I think it's a, I think it's a drag queen term, but you paint for the back row. Mm -hmm. So that, that's kind of the mentality that you have, especially people that are coming and seeing a show. Right. They right. know you're playing a part. Yeah. So if they're in the front row and your makeup's a little bit heavy, um, it's not the end of the world. You know, like it's, it's part of the overall theatrical experience, but in those large venues like that, everything's more exaggerated. You use brighter, brights and darker darks and you you know you exaggerate every single little detail but at that point like on the player stage especially with um just an average show you know just just any normal show um men typically don't need to wear makeup like in right. in our venue um because it is so intimate and so like some face powder to, so you're not shiny in the lights that's about it but in those large venues, men have to wear full contour. I mean, you have to structure out their face so somebody that is 60, 70, 100 feet away from the stage can still be like, oh, I can see their face, you know? Right. It's, yeah. it's, a, it's a whole other realm. 
and their features, you know, mm -hmm. because the stage lights are so bright that they kind right. of blend everything together Absolutely. if they're not outlined and crisp and yep. crazy. The things that we don't think about, you know. Right. right. Yeah. So that's the, so Hedwig is the craziest show you've ever worked on. Yes. So what is your favorite show you've ever worked on? My favorite show I've ever worked on, um, uh, La Cajo Full. Mm -hmm. I worked on a production of it in Dallas at Uptown Players. We performed in the Kalita Humphreys. Um, it was a summer show three years ago, four years ago. Uh, they, I don't know, time blends together, <laughs> but, uh, it, it was such a beautiful show. I had worked on that show a few times before and, uh, in smaller venues, Uptown Players is a full equity and they have a large house. And fortunately, one of my friends was the wig designer and he, I had just moved back to the central Texas area and he had called me and said, I need help on this show if you want to come and have some fun this summer. And so I went up and uh, fun isn't necessarily the word I'd put to it. <laughs> right. So that theater, um, a lot of the times when they do large shows, they rent Broadway packages. And so they'll rent the sets from Broadway. They'll rent the costumes. They'll even rent the hair. Mm -hmm. So for Locajo Full, I, I think we had a cast of 15 um, and we had, I believe, 108 or 110 hair pieces. Oh, my show. goodness. Um, I don't know how many costumes because at, for that show, I was also a costume changer and wigs and makeup. Um, and uh, it, it was wild. It was wild. The opening number of that show, we had six chorus performers that were in drag because uh, it's, it's the same story as... Um, the Birdcage, right. if you're not familiar with Lacajo Full. Um, but the performers at the very beginning, they had five costume changes in the song, in the opening song. <laughs> in the one song. In the one song. So it was it was chaos because we had our costume team, uh, you know, split up, and then we had the wig team split up, and all of us just bobby pins and zippers and but it was it was so much fun. It was so, so much fun. It was such a great experience and I remember when uh, my friend Michael, that was the wig designer for that, was pulling out hair pieces and stuff, and we found some that had some Broadway legends names sewn into the wig cap because oh Harvey Firestein wore this wig and John Barrowman wore that one, you know? Yeah. And it, it's just like, what? That's so I'm amazing. Right, it's so amazing. We had Kelsey Grammer's hair piece for when he was on the show. Like, it was wild, but it was such a great experience because it, it was like working backstage on a Broadway show. It was, you know? So it was, it was really, really just such a great time. It was such a great summer. It went by way too fast. Oh, I bet. And, you know, I think this is so, so interesting because, you know, a lot of people aren't going to think of wig designers, makeup artists, especially if they're normally coming to see shows at the Wimberley Playhouse. Because we are a smaller venue, we don't normally need a lot of makeup. And then, you know, we don't do a lot of wigs. Right. Um, so I think this is like a really, really unique perspective. Um, Absolutely. And something that, you know, maybe someone really is interested in theater, but they're also interested in makeup or hair. And this is an awesome way to marry those passions just like you've done. And you've had some cool experiences doing that. Oh yeah. Well, and you know, what really pushed me and drove me to get into hair, first of all, if you love makeup, um, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. I love makeup too. That was my driving force behind everything. But when it came to marrying that with theater, hair had to happen. And right. so I mentored under some great people. I learned a ton of techniques. I'm constantly refreshing what I learned by watching other people's tutorials on YouTube and, and other avenues. Um, but I got into uh, working for a retail cosmetic company mm -hmm. and it was great. I learned a ton. I got to do makeup all day, every day, but it was retail. So I didn't have the opportunity to do theater like I had been because yeah. I work backstage, but I also perform on stage as, mm -hmm. as an actor. Uh, and I didn't have that opportunity for several years as I was working with this uh, corporate retail company. So that was what really drove me to be like, I need to learn how to do wigs because I want to have some connection to theater 
that isn't going to consume my nights and week- weekends, you know, right. um, that I-, I can still be an active participant. I can still have a home in the theater and pursue the craft that I love. Right. So that, that was my real big driving force behind it. Yeah, because you um, recently designed the wigs for Anything Goes at Dripping Springs, right? Yes, at the high school. I sure did. Yeah. Yeah, that was an awesome show. I look at pictures from that show. First of all, Dripping Springs High School had an amazing... I know. (laughs) They blow me away constantly. I know. But I look at those photos, and I look at the photos that you have of the wigs you did, and I'm like, oh my gosh, this is so cool. Yeah. It was really awesome. I'm, I'm really yeah. thankful to Nora, who costumes of the players periodically. She reached out to me because she was working on that production. Yeah. So I hadn't got to do it. And uh, 1940s hair is so much fun. Right. I mean, well, it's it's somewhere between 30s and 40s, but it's, yeah. it's the side part and the finger waves. And yeah, it's fun. It's fun. It's not like you know, 90s hair. Here's some bangs and some straight hair, you know, like. And it's something that like, you know, nobody's going to call you up normally and be like, hey, Nick, can you come do my hair 1930s style? Right. You know? Exactly, exactly. So it's a, like a different and unique way to practice those skills yep. and execute them. Absolutely. That's amazing. Well, Nicholas, thank you so much. I appreciate you taking your time out of your day to do this. Absolutely. Thank you for picking my brain about this. Of course. Well, everyone, we will be back soon with another one of these interviews. We hope you are loving it and enjoying it. um, And we hope to see you at the theater soon, as soon as it is safe for everybody. So until then, bye. Bye.